Hello guys, why it's David Vokes again, and here I am once again uh, waking up to a few clouds, and but it's very beautiful, it's a little, you know, pleasant out, it's not really too cold, and it's a beautiful spring day, hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Oh man, we've got some very interesting things to cover today, this is going to be the third in the series, looks like we're going to probably do four, maybe five i want to get through chapter three and now we're just beginning chapter two we did two videos and we only got through the first chapter and this one's going to be completely amazing information that i know beyond a doubt you've never heard before i mean some of these things we're going to talk about we've mentioned throughout our little videos that we've been doing now for some years i've been mentioning all of these things but here we're going to get right to the you know uh, the nook and cranny of it all. We're going to dig down deep and we're going to find where some of this information got started, why people believed in the Sabbath and the law and how it came into being and who Yahweh is and so forth. And this is going to get very interesting. Well, let me just start right off the bat. We'll just read the first verse here because uh, I don't know how else to start this. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. Oh, buddy. we got to dig into the meanings of these words because I don't think most people understand when they're reading this. They, it, they would be shocked if they if they really knew the meanings of some of these words. But number one, right off the bat, we have to take note of the fact that it was the heavens and the earth that was finished. Because only the heavens and the earth were ever created. Bara. By Elohim. By, remember, the Elohim is all of the deities. or it, We don't know not about all of them, but I suspect it is because, I mean, not only the 12 deities around the astrological wheel, um, but as the Bible says over and over again, we were in Christ from the founding of the world. And at the laying of the foundations of the earth in the book of Job, we were all there. We clapped our hands for joy. So we were in the spiritual realm with our Father in heaven. Now, we've covered this pretty good in the last two videos. But I just want to point out the consistency here. It's only, as we said yesterday, it doesn't say that the Elohim made the abyss or the darkness or anything he simply said let there be light that's how he made the entire world by speaking and this is consistent we're not just you know pointing out weird strange anomalies like oh maybe that doesn't really mean anything no this is consistent throughout the bible even there in the new testament because it was jesus or the word what do you do with the word you speak who created everything. And it's consistent with the book of Hebrews. It says that it was by faith that the entire world was framed or created. And he spoke it and he said, let it be. That's how, it, that's how he made the world in Genesis chapter one. Let there be. Now it never says, let there be darkness. He never spoke that into existence. He never said, let there be war. Okay, we're going to find out here that this particular deity that ends his work and rests, he makes soldiers and armies. And, and that's, that's what we just got through reading. This is the heavens and the earth were finished and all of the armies. Now it says hosts in the King James Version, but what is this word army? Is it just mean, sometimes people think that it just means, you know, army-like. They're like, like you could call a bunch of grasshoppers armies okay so if yah uh our father in heaven made the the animals he made armies no 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 this is not armies uh, animals aren't army armies this word is to do with war it has to do with battle it has to do with soldiers this is you can't say that the word soldier is the same thing as humans or animals or trees and it's not even like army the trees aren't like armies and 
Uh, a pack of dogs, not like armies. Not, not, not at all. That's not what the word means. So this, this word armies always used with Yahweh. He is the, the God of armies, the God of battle. And really that's saying he's the God of war. So this doesn't already sound like our father in heaven. And we're going to get into that. It, it, that's going to present itself, this, this theme, what we're talking about here, all the way through this, this video today. Everything that, that this chapter talks about. And so, um, it was on the seventh day that Elohim, now it doesn't mention Yahweh at this point, but remember, it doesn't mention Yahweh at all in the first chapter of Genesis. It just says Elohim. The um, ancient esoteric wisdom that this came from, remember when the Jewish people went down into Babylon, they came out with this understanding, the lower carnal form of astrology. And they only knew about their deity, which was at the bottom of the wheel. They never understood that, that their father was not the father in heaven, but he was the father at the bottom of the wheel. Uh, like in the Sumerian tablets, the, the deity of the Abzu, which today is we've, we call that the abyss or the bottomless pit which I've said is the darkness that our Father in Heaven didn't make. and never said He made the darkness, but there was darkness revealed because of the Father saying, let there be light. And then whenever you identify something, when you say, now I am, now I exist, you're, you're saying you exist because there's a possibility out there of not existing. And so the fact that we are alive the fact that we live and breathe um, is when we say that we're we're literally saying there are something there's something out there that doesn't live and breathe that's not real. The fact that I am means that there could be something that is not. So the fact that there is such a thing as duality in the universe doesn't mean, though, that the ultimate duality you know you can have duality everywhere, like left and right, up and down, but the ultimate duality is existence and non-existence. And therefore you see that really the duality is just saying that there is only the divine being. Because the opposite of that is nothing. So the same thing with light and darkness. Darkness is ignorance. You can't see where you're going. You have no knowledge, no understanding. And since the universe really is consciousness, then all that really is, what we're really saying is, is that um, when we begin to imagine we're creating thoughts and forms in our mind, light forms, if we stop thinking, if we stop, if we cease thinking, imagining or doing, and we're going to talk about this doing here, sometimes in the Bible is translated working, but there's two different words the doing of our Father in Heaven, something completely different than the slavery that Yahweh de demands from His people. Uh, so much here that we're going to cover. <laughs> I don't want to give any of that away. We'll get to that. But the deities who made the world in the Sumerian tablets and the Babylonian and all the ancient esoteric wisdom was all of the deities, everyone who was in the one, the oneness of the divine, which means that everyone was there, all his children, the father, the divine mother, and all of his children were there. And everybody's his children. And Jesus said, I've not lost a one except the son of destruction. So there's another child, right? But it's not the child of the father. It's the son of destruction. And where is destruction? In Sheol, in Hades. And remember, Father in Heaven didn't make Hades. So Hades doesn't exist. Hades is the darkness. And the darkness was over the surface of the deep. There was no darkness on the original earth that the Elohim made. But yet, we're going to find out through in the second chapter here that this is all about, now we're talking about Yahweh of the Elohim. The Elohim made in six days the heavens and the earth. But, as we've said, not the abyss, not the darkness. 
Well, that means that one of these Elohim, and it tells us here, Yahweh Elohim, or Iya Inki, Yahweh Elohim also took part in the creation. Okay, but but it was a little different, as we said. Not in the same way. It wasn't bara, the Greek bara, which is to fashion or create the world, to manifest the world. Now, the, the, you can only manifest that which really is. And the heavens and the earth really are. And the light really is. And it shines down from above. But the other part that was made, that, that was made from Yahweh's word, or through his mechanism of making things. And we're going to read about here in, in Genesis chapter 2, which is a different kind of a creation, although it's not really a creation. But, as it says in Isaiah, we, we talked about how Jeremiah, if you go and you read that, and we're probably still not going to read that today, talks about a creation even before Genesis chapter 1. And then everything ended and it was void and empty and the earth was upside down and it was all destroyed the destroyer the one of the the deity of the armies the soldiers who come to destroy who teaches your hands for warfare according to david that's a different deity and he creates the base gross form and he made adam and eve from the dust of the earth that's not the same thing it's a completely we're going to find out this this whole Six days of creation is going to start all over again. But not really all over again. It's just that we're going to find that in the six days from Yahweh's point of view, he's just busy working on creating his kingdom, which is this little garden. How does he get on land if he didn't create the land? How, he's, he's down there in the abyss. That's where his throne is. Capricorn, Saturn, down there in the abyss. Aquarius and Capricorn and Pisces and so forth. He rules down there. How does he get up on the land? Well, in Revelation chapter 13, it says, I saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Now, he's the exact image of the dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Leviathan that we talked about yesterday, who's in the great sea down there in the abyss, which the darkness is over that, and that, that's at the bottom of the of the wheel where winter is. And as we said, the night sky was considered the abyss. And in the night sky, you could see these stars, these wandering stars to whom is reserved the darkness and the blackness forever and ever, according to the Apostle Peter. So, looking into that area, our Father in Heaven didn't create that. That's the outer. Our Father in Heaven's in the inner, the light. And he manifests into the stable reality and he makes the trees and, 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 and vegetation, but they're light trees. They're not the dense form. So all the while that our Father in Heaven, part of the Elohim, was making, creating the world, by their creation, they automatically made the devil because they had to give everybody free will. And so we can have our own illusion. We can use our word and create but it doesn't make anything real. It's just an illusion. Images that are fading. The Apostle Peter talks about the, the grass and the vegetation, which grows and then one day you cut it down and grind it up into a loaf of bread and put it in the fire and bake it and it's gone. Fire comes along and it's all gone. Temporary. That's this grosser, lower form that Yahweh was in charge of, this darkness. But somehow or another, this Tiamat, this dragon that is in the sea, he's mirrored in the ocean as a beast. That's that emotion. When these fears and this anger, this, you know, Yahweh says, I am jealous and that is my name. I am the God of vengeance. When that kind of thing that doesn't really exist, you know, that's not part of the kingdom of our Lord. That's, that's Yahweh's kingdom. He's the God of war. He's the God of vengeance. But he's in the abyss. Somehow or another, 
his reflection into the our emotions, which is an illusion. It's a monster. Monsters don't exist. But there it is, and we're scared of it. We went down into the illusion. We went down into the sea. We weren't supposed to be in the sea. We were supposed to be up in the light, in the kingdom of the Lord. Not in the, you know, we're, we're not the children of the darkness, the Bible says, the New Testament. We're not the children of the night. We're children of the day. Go, go ye forward unto the light. So, this mirror of this evil is mirrored in the water by, in our emotions and, and it stirs up the sea. Well, now, why is this beast seen in the book of Revelation chapter 13? It says, I saw the beast standing on the sea on the shores, on the sands of the sea. Well, he's coming up out of the sea. Why? Because he wants to bring his illusion into the creation of the Lord, of our Father in heaven. He wants to bring this illusion in. It's He's a liar. That's what he does. He's a liar and a deceiver. Your father is from beneath, Jesus said. My father's above. My father's love. So Revelation chapter 13 says, I saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns. He's the image of the dragon with seven heads and ten horns that's in the abyss, in, in the astral sky, in the night sky. But it says this beast came up from the ocean, from the sea, and he stood upon the sea shore, upon the sands of the sea. What's he doing coming up out of the sea? He's trying to get into your consciousness on the land. Okay, when I'm talking about higher consciousness up in the heavens, but just in this outer conscious world that we live in, that is sacred place. That is something that the Lord provided for us. The forms, the beautiful forms, the fruit of the trees, the love, the joy, the mildness, the goodness, the kindness, the gentleness and the, and the self-control. Those are states of being. Beautiful states of being that our Father gave us in this stability, this earth. But it wasn't the gross, lower form that Yahweh wanted to make it. So it says, Eden, we're not going to get, you know, we're not there yet, but we might be jumping ahead a little bit. But Eden was eastward. Why? Because as I said, the sun is the light and that's where the good kingdom is. That's where our Father in Heaven is from. The light is from there. And so, Eden was east, but that's not what Yahweh made. He didn't make Eden. He made a garden eastward toward Eden. Not in Eden, but toward Eden. As close as he could get up on the land, he crawled up out of the sea. He was, in, he was in, he got into your emotions. And he was being reflected. He's a lie. He doesn't exist. He's down there in this abyss, this darkness, in your fears, in your, in the unknown. We, we just made him up. And he crawled up into our emotions. And now he's crawling up on the sands of the seashore. He's coming up onto the land and he makes a little garden. Now, this is his creation. So, if you'll notice in Exodus chapter 20, when it gives you the commandments, it says you got to keep the Sabbath because you have to remember the Sabbath. Why? Because in six days, the Lord, thy God, Yahweh, thy Elohim, your Elohim, not my Elohim, but Yahweh, the deity of soldiers and armies in war, who's down there in the darkness, he made a different creation. And it's talked about here in the second chapter of Genesis. It, it's a completely different order. We're going to find all the little things. I mean, it's completely out of order. I mean, our Father in Heaven made first vegetation and, and then fish and then birds and then mammals and then men. And successive graduation upward. But in this, we see all kinds of things. It says before it was in the earth. Well, 
starting with verse 5 there, and we're, we're not there yet, but I'm going to jump ahead to verse 5 because it says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For Yahweh, Elohim, your, your Yahweh, Elohim, your Yahweh of the Elohim, who is your deity, had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there wasn't any man to till the ground. But there went a mist up from the earth and it watered the whole face of the ground. And Yahweh of the Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground, the elemental, the baser, grosser form. See, formed him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Okay, so before there were any trees, before there was any rain, before there was anything, Yahweh makes Adam. That's not the same order as Genesis chapter 1. And there's a lot of inconsistencies. It talks about how good the gold was there. What's he so interested in gold for? Well, the back, the, 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 the Sumerian tablets and the Babylonian tablets tell us that Inki, Ia Inki was mining gold and he needed human beings to be his slave. But there's a lot of other inconsistencies here. So let's go back again. We'll cover later, because I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll cover, cover later how, you know, in the first chapter of Genesis, the animals were made before man. But in this creation story, he makes Adam before there was even any vegetation growing. And then he starts making animals and bringing them to the man to see what the man would call them. So the animals were made after Adam. So everything's completely out of order. In fact, almost backwards. Completely backwards. Well, that would be appropriate because this is a backwards deity who lives down in the abyss, who is in the darkness. And then there's a lot of things that he does that we know couldn't have been our father. First of all, he makes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he says, now don't eat of it. But our father in heaven wanted us to eat of it. He wanted us to become like him, have our eyes opened and have eternal life. But remember, Yahweh drove us out of the garden. He didn't want us to have eternal life. And the New Testament says that our Father in heaven cannot be tempted with evil, neither can he tempt any man with evil. And our Father in heaven is love, and our Father in heaven is light, and there is no darkness in him. So he couldn't make the darkness. He didn't live down there, and he couldn't, he didn't have any wrath. So he couldn't have drove Adam and Eve out of the garden in his wrath. And in thy wrath, he said, you shall not enter into my rest. So whose rest is this? Whose Sabbath is this? We're going to show in the Ten Commandments that these Ten Commandments were words. Remember, the creation was spoken by the word Jesus, the true creation. But this creation is by Yahweh's word. And what is his word? The ten words that, he, that all of Israel heard. Well, they're not the words of my father in heaven because Jesus said, you've never heard my father or seen his form. But yet the 70 elders of Israel sat down and ate and drank with Yahweh. And Moses saw Yahweh's glory and saw his form. They ate and drank with him. Well, Yahweh's also came to the earth and spoke to Abraham. So there are two separate groups of manuscripts that they put together to make the Old Testament. There is the manuscripts that were gathered from the northern tribes of Israel that worshipped at Beth El, or the house of El. And there was the manuscripts that the Jews had when they came up out of Babylon. And they were the lower commandments and the lower deity. So you find all the way through the New Testament, or the Old Testament, the two different manuscripts. Here you have Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Two different creations. You also have two different stories about the flood. You have two different stories about the covenant. Abraham met the Most High. And his priest was Melchizedek, which the Bible tells us is a higher priesthood than Levi. And he didn't ask for sacrifice. He didn't ask to kill his son. He didn't ask for... He had to do anything. 
He didn't, you know, do anything like that. It was simply a promise. He didn't make any vows. Remember, Jesus said, don't make any vows. Don't vow by heaven or earth. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. But this is a foul mouth deity. He's constantly cursing in his wrath. And um, so when the Most High, through his priest, higher priesthood, Melchizedek, came, he brought bread and wine. That's the covenant that Jesus brought. It's a new covenant, which is really not a, a an old commandment, but or a new commandment, but an old commandment in that you've had that one from the very beginning. See, the new commandment is only new to those who don't know anything about it. <laughs> because Abraham already knew about this. He received the promise. The Apostle Paul says it was 430 years after that when Yahweh came to him, not the Most High El Elyon, who made the covenant of communion and bread and wine and love and promises. And no commandments and no sacrifices and no, no commandments or anything. But he, you know, he simply made a promise. But 430 years later, Yahweh came and made all these commandments. And it says, but the, the law could not make void the promise. So we're still under the promise. Don't you worry. But you have to understand. Don't be deceived. You're under the promise. We all get our salvation for free by, by his promise and by his love. But these two manuscripts are all the way through. Now, when it, the book of Psalms is about half Elohim, most high, El Elyon, and half of it's Yahweh. And this goes through the prophets. There's Jeremiah, Isaiah, and then there's Daniel, Ezekiel. These are two different prophets, two different gods. Ezekiel and Daniel, they were prophets of El. Isaiah talks about Yahweh and his mountain and destroying the world and law shall go forth and the wicked shall die and the blood shall be up to the horses' bridles and blah, blah, blah. And all the nations shall die in a great Armageddon. And oh, it's terrible what this deity has in mind. His wrath for all the world. But obviously that's not our father in heaven. So here, the first chapter is only Elohim. And of course, all the deities participated in creation. But some of the deities, Yahweh of the Elohim, who enters in the second chapter, his creation was a little different. And his word, he used his word too, you know, Elohim spoke, created, Yahweh spoke the ten words. And it's through his law that he made the form. Really, that's, that's all that is his structure, his kingdom, contrived. It's not real. Government in this world is not truly real it's a wild beast it's operating under the lower baser instinctual nature of the animals that are wild not the domesticated animals not the living creatures that our father in heaven has around his throne it's the difference between living creatures like lambs and cattle domesticated animals but not wild creatures so verse 7 says Yahweh formed man of the dust of the ground, the elemental form. He formed him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And now man being dual from the elements of the ground and the spirit. And together the spirit and the body makes the soul. Very few people really understand that, and we're going to talk about that when we get to chapter 3 as well, but when you die, dust shall return to the dust as it were from whence it came. And the spirit shall return to the Elohim. Because you see, spirit belongs with spirit and dust with dust. And man is a dual thing. We've got the lower nature and the higher. Yeah, the, uh, we've got the illusion in us. But we have to finally awaken to the Christ in us and start realizing we don't listen to the words of Yahweh, that vengeful, jealous deity who makes these laws, says, I am God and there is none else. Get down on your knees and worship me. Stone people and, and genocide and slavery. And that's what we're really going to talk about here. Because let's go back to, um, again, we're just completely getting ahead of ourselves, but we have to kind of know a little of what went on after so that we can really understand what happened before. So, 
Going back then to Genesis, the very first few verses where it talks about the creation was finished. And it was on the seventh day that Elohim, and, and we know this was Yahweh, as we've been pointing out, because this whole creation is not the same. He ended his work. Now, you know, you could say just Elohim, because remember, it was in six days that the Elohim, and this was all the deities, but Yahweh's included in this. He had his hand, his creation with his word in the darkness, in the unreality, coming up onto the sands of the sea and building this little hedge and taking Adam and making him into form. That was his creation, sort of superimposed on the real creation. And so it was, it was indeed on the seventh day that Elohim ended the work of creation. And Elohim blessed the seventh day. Well, one of the Elohim did. But we're going to show, we're going to prove actually that it wasn't our Father in heaven that blessed the seventh day and made it or set it apart and made it holy. But it was Yahweh of the Elohim that blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which he had made. Now look at Exodus chapter 20. Here is the ten words whereby he makes his government his world. The world that is passing away and so is this desire, my friends. And the God of this world who's blinding the minds of the unbelievers by means of these lies, these words that he spoke that created this unreality. It says, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh, thy deity in vain, for the Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, why would we remember? What does it mean, remember? Well, because he's in Exodus chapter 20, he's taking you back to Genesis. He says, remember I made the Sabbath way back in Genesis chapter 2. So, you know, and he's going to explain why. Because there were six days shalt thou labor. Now, that word in the Hebrew means to be a slave. It doesn't mean to just accomplish something like a chore or a business. Which we're going to find out is the word that's, you know, our... The, Jesus says, we're, we're going to take you to a scripture where Jesus says that his father doesn't rest. He's not like that deity who's like, what, uh, like a, a mere man, what is needs rest. I mean, our father in heaven doesn't rest. And Jesus says, we'll show that. Well, let's skip over that and then we'll get back to this. So in John chapter 5, verse 17, and this is the actual interlinear so you can see the actual words there that, that are written in the actual real Greek it says answer them the father of me until now is working and I am working see they accuse Jesus and the disciples of working breaking the Sabbath and they didn't just accuse him they said you are I mean he was standing right there the apostles and Jesus were were working they were harvesting grain and they said, why don't you keep the Sabbath? Because Moses tells us to keep the Sabbath. And Jesus said, my father, the father of me, not your father, because he often says, your father says, but I say. Moses says, but I say. And then sometimes it's your father's from beneath, but my father's above. So there's totally, this is not just arbitrary. I'm talking nonsense here. This is real. My father, who's different than yours, until now, or in other words, in English, keeps on, still is, never has quit working, never will, but even until this day, <laughs> to this day, <laughs> to this day, is working. But notice that the word there for working, but notice that the word for work is not a slave. It's not, he's not saying, um, my father is a slave. He's always been a slave and he always will be. It's not the same word. There in Genesis where we word, it, 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 where in Exodus, I mean, where in the 10 words of Yahweh, 
Remember, Jesus said, you've never heard my father. So that's not his word. But in his words, he says, you will do all your labor. You will be a slave six days. Well, Jesus is not saying I'm a slave and we anybody should be a slave. He's simply saying that his father is um, performing or practicing or doing. Not, not necessarily being a slave at all. That's not what this word means. Accomplishing. Going about his business. Now, there's another word similar to this in Exodus that's similar to this word, doing business. And that is Malik. And we'll, we'll cover that in a moment. But, so Jesus is saying, my father keeps on doing his business. Remember, he just spoke a word. And that's why in the Old Testament, when it says that the Lord worked six days, it didn't say he worked, it says he melaka. And that comes from the word melek, which is angel. And why would, what would, what would an angel, the word messenger, what would it have to do with work? Well, because a messenger, that may not even be the right word. We're, we're running around saying angels are messengers. They're more of an, they're more than messengers, they're ambassadors. Because they come to do the father's business. See, they're, they're doing his business. They're not necessarily, uh, they're not slaves, right? These are high, powerful beings, some of these angels. But what they're doing is they're spokesmen, they're messengers, they're spokesmen. And remember, creation was done by the word, it was created by the word. And so that's what it's saying, that, that our Father in heaven spoke the message spoke the word through Jesus, through all of us, through our word, through intelligence, through logic, he created the world. And he continued to speak and to create thoughts and forms. He keeps creating. He doesn't rest. He doesn't go to sleep. He's, he's dynamic energy. He's a light. He doesn't have this gross physical body that needs to rest. So there's really no way to get around this. Jesus is very clear. He says, yes, I am working. Look at, look at on the page there. I, you're reading it right from the Greek here in the Greek interlinear. This is word for word. He says, I am working. Now he said that standing there before the Sanhedrin on the Sabbath, they caught him red handed. Him and the disciples were picking grain and it was a Sabbath. And he said, yep, you're right. I'm working. But you know, that's because my father, not your father, my father keeps on working even till now. He never stopped. He doesn't have to. He doesn't rest. Now that's very odd. Let's go back then to Exodus. Picking up from where we left off. Six days you will be a slave. Look it up, friends. We're not going to go through each of these words here because it would take forever. But that word labor is literally the word that's used throughout the Old Testament for slavery. Okay? So Yahweh says, remember the Sabbath. I was there on back in Genesis chapter 2 when the Elohim rested. Some of the Elohim rested. But Jesus says, that wasn't my father. My father was in heaven. Okay? But Yahweh of the Elohim rested and he, he's the one in Genesis chapter 2 that makes this other creation, the form. And he says, you shall do all thy labor and all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle. How are you going to stop the cattle from eating grass or uh, running? Um, well, I mean, people translate that or interpret that to mean that you're not supposed to use your cattle as slaves. But that just lends to the truth of what's going on here. You see, we're talking about slavery. Because you can't stop cattle from eating grain. You know, Jesus is out eating grain in the field. Well, the cattle will do that. The cattle and the horses and everybody will do that. But just don't use the cattle as slavery. 
Don't force your cow with a harness to plow your field on the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, you're not, you don't have to be a slave. You get to rest. Remember, in the New Testament, there's neither slave nor freeman, neither Jew nor Greek. This is a totally different deity and a totally different covenant and a totally different law. And this deity right here is saying he wants you to be a slave for six days and serve him. That We're not going to get into it here and show it, but in the uh, if you keep reading down past uh, chapter 21, Exodus 21, the next chapter, it goes into the 11th and 12th commandments. The 11th commandment is you got to be a slave and the 12th commandment is when you sell your daughter as a slave. Remember, all women were slaves. Their husbandman means their owner. And so, you know, they would go to Abraham, Laban's house and purchase a wife for their son. They purchased them. They were, that's why Jesus said he came to redeem us. And then after he purchased us to be his wife, in a, it's a covenant relationship, he set us free. He says, I'm, you're not my slaves. But, you know, a slave doesn't know what his master's doing, but I've told you everything I've done, and therefore you are my friends. But, so, we know that this second chapter is not a real creation. It doesn't use the word creation. It uses the word form. We know that he formed Adam out of order, in a backwards uh, order. He made Adam first, and then he made the animals, and then he made the, the plants, I guess. Whereas in the other creation story, it's completely opposite. Uh, we know that everything that the Lord Yahweh did was completely out of character for our Father in Heaven to do. Our Father in Heaven doesn't tempt people with evil. He doesn't put... Uh, he doesn't command us not to become like him. We're his children. We're heirs. Heirs with Christ. Join heirs with Christ. Heirs of deity. Look what love the Father hath that we should become the children, that we should be called the children of the divine one. That's what the Apostle Peter says. So, um, this, this deity blesses and curses all the time. And our New Testament tells us not to do any cursing or swearing, but just let your yes mean yes. And the New Testament tells us to be forgiving because he says your heavenly father lets the sunshine on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he doesn't keep account of your injury. And he is love. And the Apostle Peter says that um, there is no jealousy in love. And yet Yahweh is jealous. So we can go on and on and on with all the inconsistencies here. This is not our Father in Heaven. So starting with verse 4, as we, we've read this already, but I want to cover it real carefully because I want you to understand there's no question what we're saying here. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh made the earth and the heavens. Now, remember, again, Yahweh didn't make the earth and the heavens. But he has his own earth and his own heavens and they are passing away. He has his own uh, government. And that's why when Jesus was on the earth, he says that not one jot or tittle in this law will in any way perish for until heaven and earth pass away. But Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away. And the apostles say, the heavens that are now are stored up and reserved for fire. Right? And the heavens that were of old were destroyed by means of water. So, too, the heavens and the earth that are now are reserved for fire. What heavens and earth? Why would the Lord destroy his earth? Because it got corrupted with these illusions, with this darkness, this beast, this imagery, the illusion that came up out of that, that mirrored itself in our emotions and crawled up and got into our world and started deceiving everybody by means of law. Because the accuser accuses you day and night before my father's throne. And the only way he can accuse you is by means of law. But remember, he's just a slanderer. Jesus told us, come and follow me. I love you. So, 
every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it ever grew. There wasn't any plants. And yet Yahweh began to create Adam. And then after he created Adam, he did that all first. And then he starts forming the animals and bringing them to Adam that was already formed. So look in verse uh, chapter 2, verse Verse 19 says, out of the ground, see, out of the dust, Yahweh formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. That's kind of backwards. He starts with the beast, then he goes to the bird. And he brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. Now, if you're just forming the animal, then that's when the animal begins right? He, he just now made them. He formed them. But Adam's already there. In fact, he's already there in the sense that he's wise and he's uh, tasked with the job of naming all of the animals. He's like in charge. This is the garden of Yahweh. This is his creation. It's superimposed on the actual creation. It's the way things are done by Yahweh and it did it through his word, his commandments. That's the way his beast, his bestial governments were formed. And these wild beasts that he brought to Adam were not really the living creatures that the Lord made, but they were wild, ferocious carnivores. And that is the beast that is in the sea that is the governments of this world that was made by law. So, let's go back again where we left off. Verse 8, Yahweh planted a garden. I mean, it didn't even, see, in this case, it doesn't say formed a garden, but he planted it. He didn't create it. So, the earth already was there and he, he took some seeds from plants that the Elohim, our Father in Heaven and our Divine Mother already made. He took some, some seeds and he planted this fake little garden. He put a hedge about it and said, go no further. Till the soil. Be my slave. But he planted the garden. He didn't create Eden, but he planted the garden on the land eastward towards the sun. Right? He was trying, he was encroaching upon the light. He was trying to bend and warp the light and confuse Adam. And out of the dust or out of the ground made Yahweh to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Well, mm, I don't know if it's really good for food because he makes a tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he tells Adam, you can't eat from these trees. But he wouldn't even let him eat for the tree of life. He didn't want Adam to be alive. Well, I mean, if you're going to be the son of the little divine being made in his image, don't you think you're going to live like forever? Why would our father in heaven who makes Adam in, in Genesis chapter one says in it is good. Why would he then say, oh, well, um, but you got to die now. That's not our father in heaven. And there was a river that went out of Eden. Oh, so the river didn't go out of the garden. No, sirree. That's the river of life. And the river went out of Eden. It was eastward. That's the paradise. And it watered the garden. Oh. So he's kind of stealing water, I guess. You know, you ever heard that joke where uh, the devil's down there and they're living it up, right? And oh, it's a wonderful place down there in hell. And he's like, where'd you get all this water? He says, ah, oh, we just stole it. You know, the, the devil steals stuff, right? He just uses what belongs to somebody else. And anyway, it was parted and became in four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, and that which is compassing the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Why is our Father in heaven, if this were him, why would he be interested in gold? Yahweh's interested in it. He was like, oh, looky here. I'm going to make this little spot down here in the earth where there's a lot of gold because the where this information was taken from the Babylonian tablets and from the Sumerian tablets, the ancient esoteric wisdom. Remember, the Jews went down into Babylon for 70 years. They came out with this information, but they only came out with a lower comprehension. 
and they chose uh, this. They became deceived by the lower forces and the deity that was in the bottomless pit. And they began to obey him. He said, you will get down on your knees, obey. And they got scared. They were deceived. And they, he put him to work. He says, I want you to work for six days. Why? He had an operation going down here. We were going to till the garden. The garden was going to provide food for the slaves. Don't you know that's what it says in the Sumerian tablets? Yeah, we've done some videos on that. So anyway, um, let's go to verse 14. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, and that is the one that goes toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. So Yahweh of the Elohim took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden. But it's, remember, it, he didn't make Eden, but there was a place that was already made called Eden and he made the garden toward Eden. And so he put him in there to what? To be a slave, to dress it and to keep it. Hmm. And we get more information about that in the Sumerian tablets and the, and the, the other amazing holy scriptures that uh, the esoteric wisdom that the great priesthoods of all the nations wrote down in their holy books. And all of them had the information about Yahweh at the bottom of the wheel, but they understood they had the balance. They knew that there was the God of heaven and the deity that was in the sea. But we're just reading the priests, the Levitical priests who were only priests of Yahweh and did not, they were blind. They didn't have the higher priesthood of Melchizedek. So, Yahweh tells him, of every tree of the garden you may eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that they will eat of it, you will surely die. Hmm. That wasn't a lie. The Apostle Paul tells us that in order to have life, we have to die. That which is made alive is not made alive unless first it dies. The Lord gives it a, a body as it pleases him. It may be a bare seed. The seed, you plant it in the earth, it dies and then it, it's reborn. It comes up and blossoms like the rose. That's the miracle. Well, evidently, Yahweh wasn't aware of this. That he was only, you know, I mean, if he didn't have to be. I mean, he just does what Yahweh does. He's angry. And so it's that law, this lower place, that when you come in to this place, you come here to die. And you come here to be ruled over by this mean deity. It's his creation. And so... The only way that we could have even got here is because we were deceived. That's what the Lord Jesus told us. He says, your father's a liar. He's a deceiver. And that's why we're here. We got bamboozled. And he gives these commandments. Don't eat of the knowledge of good and evil. But you see, that's the very thing that Christianity is about. I keep saying over and over again in all the videos we've been doing, probably one of the most, if not the most important verse in the New Testament is this. This is the epitome of the gospel. This means eternal life. Eternal life? Well, Yahweh don't want us to have eternal life. In his wrath, he drove us out, right? Oh, but Jesus said, I came to give you life. Well, so the Old Testament says we can't have life, right? He's angry every day with the wicked. But the New Testament says that we're going to have eternal life By taking in knowledge of God. Well, that's not the same thing here. Uh, they were trying to become like God in their pride, David. And that can't stand why Yahweh is the only deity. He had to discipline them. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, ye are gods. Now, someone in the comment the other day said, oh, it doesn't say that. It says, are ye gods? As a question. All of you are the sons of the Most High. You're not gods. That's not really what it's saying. It's saying, well, 
I suppose it might be subjective. If, you know, you can sometimes interpret verses two different ways. But what is the true interpretation of that verse? Well, it's in Psalms. And it's in Psalms 82. And it says, are ye gods or ye are gods? However you want to translate it. But in the end, it's the same thing. You're all sons of the Most High, not Yahweh. And what does Peter say? Look what love the Father has that we shall be called the sons of the Most High, the sons of the of the Divine One. Why would it be such love that we should be like, uh, call his sons? Because we are heirs. A child is an heir of his father and we're heirs with Christ and heirs of deity. And the Apostle Peter makes it very clear. He says, we will partake of the Divine Nature. In the book of Peter, he tells us that. So there's no question that that is the point here. And Jesus, when he said, are ye gods? When they, wh why was he saying that to them, the Pharisees and the scribes? Because they were saying, you speak blasphemy when you say you are one with the Father. And Jesus didn't say, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant, right? He says, I speak blasphemy? Does not the scripture your scriptures say, you all sons of the Most High. So, you be the judge of what Jesus really meant. But I think the entire New Testament is, is a testimony to the fact that we are not just some creature, mortal creature, but we're divine, immortal beings, sons of the living deity, and we are going to have eternal life as a free gift. We can't earn it. It's just simply like the prodigal son. There's a story that the son represents you and I and the father of the farm or the manor in that parable represents our father in heaven. So that farm represents everything. Well, that son was an heir, but he went out and squandered everything. And yet the father said, I still love you. You can't lose your inheritance. Now, that is as clear as one can get. The parables will interpret everything for you. But just use your common sense. This is basically the gospel according to Yahweh. He's angry. He doesn't want you to become like him. you got to know your place. And anybody who does anything wrong lightning bolt comes out of heaven and you're gone. Go and genocide the other nations. Some of the nations you could go in and kill the men, the cattle, wipe everything out, but you could take their gold and you could take their women. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that's the kind of deity either that I want to worship. If that were reality, I think we'd be screwed. But we're not stupid. We can interpret things. We have a mind. We can understand. That's a parable about the world that we live in. That is this world. And he is the God of this world. And he's blinding your mind if you believe in him because he's a deceiver. And that is very easy to understand. And so I'm simply telling you, this is the old covenant here. That we're, we're you know, this is the, the preface to the Ten Commandments because I want you to remember the Sabbath day. But that came from who? From the deity of soldiers and war and battle. And he's the one who created these, all these armies. This government by his words, his ten words that came out of his mouth. But Jesus made it very clear. That was not my father. You've never heard my father. He dwells in unapproachable light. No man can see the father and yet live. And yet you say, you heard your your deity speaking these words and you trembled and Moses was fear and trembling and said, please, oh Yahweh, please don't kill them all. And he got down on his knees and he begged him, please, what about your reputation, Yahweh? You just brought him up out of Egypt. Now you're going to come out here in the desert and kill them all? And he softened the heart and it repented, Yahweh. Our father in heaven doesn't repent because he doesn't need to because everything he does is perfect because he is love and there is no darkness in him. He is only light. So you see, obviously, any deity that needs to repent, remember it says he repented that he made man upon the earth. 
He he was sorry he even made Adam in this form to um, dig up the gold in the land of gold, right? And to be a slave over his garden. So he tried to wipe us all out and he's coming again in his wrath. But you see, in Christ, there is no condemnation and we're not appointed under the wrath because we've passed over from death to life because we're in Christ. We've awoken to who we really are. Our eyes have become opened and we recognize the Christ. So anyway, um, we're going to take it up again. We're now at a little over an hour and so we're going to have to stop there. We never get very far. We've covered a few verses. We're still in Genesis chapter 2. We'll start up there and right where we left off tomorrow. And I hope you guys have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.